Well, it's coming up to nine o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, why has the conflict in the Middle East become left versus right? People are dying. What's happening shouldn't become another chapter in the culture wars. After a number of their stars back Hamas and they refuse to call them terrorists, have the BBC let Britain down over their Israel stance? And it might take a 10 as the country's former top banker says the push to decarbonise is getting too expensive. The crazy dream of net zero is running out of gas. Two hours of big opinion, big debate and plenty of entertainment along the way. In my big opinion, in two minutes' time, I will be calling out the moral blindness of the woke left. You won't want to miss it. I'm not pulling my punches. First, here's the news and Polly Middlehurst. Mark, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the main news tonight is that the US Secretary of State has said that the Egyptian-controlled Rafa border crossing into Gaza should reopen for aid to pass into Gaza. He's fairly confident now. He says the US is also working with Egypt, Israel and the United Nations to get that assistance through that border point. Hundreds of tonnes of aid from several countries have been waiting in Egypt's Sinai Peninsula, pending a deal for its safe delivery into Gaza, together with the evacuation of some foreign passport holders through the crossing. Egypt has said it's stepped up diplomatic efforts to break the impasse. Israeli soldiers are now massing at the Gaza border in preparation for their Israeli ground assault. And the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has vowed to demolish Hamas. Anthony Blinken says the U.S., though, will continue to stand with Israel. What we're actually doing, including the deployment of these aircraft carrier uh, battle groups, uh, again, not to provoke anyone, but to, to send a very clear message of, of deterrence, that no one should do anything that widens this conflict in any way or that furthers aggression against Israel from any other direction. Well, the Prime Minister and King Abdullah of Jordan have been speaking today about the diplomatic efforts to prevent further escalation in the wider Middle East. Earlier, Rishi Sunak welcomed King Abdullah to Downing Street, the two leaders shaking hands and agreeing on the importance of taking measures to protect civilians in Gaza, including British and Jordanian citizens caught up in the violence. This comes after a fervid round of crisis talks by world leaders with others as they try to inject diplomacy into the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Meanwhile, four government flights carrying Britons have left Israel today. Two more are expected this evening to leave Tel Aviv. The Foreign Office is telling British nationals in Gaza to be ready in case the Rafah border crossing is open for more than aid. It's currently the only route out of the territory, the Foreign Secretary James Cleverly telling GB News the government is doing everything it can to get British people trapped in Gaza out. And hundreds of people gathered at a vigil in central London today to commemorate Israeli victims of the Hamas terror attack. Many were draped in Israeli flags holding posters saying bring them home with flyers being handed out featuring names and faces of those taken hostage by Hamas. A strong police presence was there which took place in Parliament Square in London. Now, away from the Israeli-Hamas conflict and onto sport, England are through to the last four of the Rugby World Cup after an astonishing 30-24 victory over Fiji in their quarter-final in Marseille. Steve Borthwick's men now facing France or South Africa in the tournament semi-finals. That means England are now into the semis for the second World Cup in a row. You're with GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. This is Britain's news channel. Thanks, Polly. We'll see you in an hour. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, why has the conflict in the Middle East become left versus right? People are dying. What's happening should not become another chapter in the culture wars. In the big story, whilst Israel has a right to defend itself, what will flattening Gaza and killing civilians achieve? We'll be joined by a senior Israeli military captain live in the studio. 
Also after a number of their stars back Hamas and they refuse to call them terrorists, have the BBC let Britain down over their Israel stance? In my take at 10, as the country's former top banker says the push to decarbonise is getting too expensive, the crazy dream of net zero is running out of gas. As Germany sparks an EU civil war by offering the UK a new trade deal, is Britain having the last laugh? Plus, are the government right to keep petty criminals out of prison and reform them instead? I'll be asking former prisons minister, politics legend Anne Widdicombe. We've got tomorrow's front pages at 10.30 sharp with three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, Tonya Buxton, Lord Culvia Ranger and Nigel Nelson. Tonight, I'll be asking the pundits, is it time to treat COVID like a cold? Is it wrong for modelling agencies to target refugee camps? And is Boris Johnson's ex-wife punishing him by joining the Labour Party? Plus, the most important part of the show, your emails. They come straight to my laptop, mark at gbnews.com. This show has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. A big two hours to come. Let's start with my big opinion. Why has everything got to be tribal these days? Why is everything left versus right? Whether it's climate change, lockdowns, vaccines, veganism, or even your preference or otherwise for Meghan Markle. And now we're seeing it with what's happening in the Middle East. How can you take sides when innocent people are dying? Well, that's exactly what we've seen since the horrific terror attack on Israel last Saturday. Within hours, people were in this country on the streets, waving the Palestinian flag. Support for Palestine is perfectly understandable in normal times. But in the aftermath of rape, child murder, the burning of bodies, the parading of corpses on the back of pickup trucks, and following the annihilation of 260 people at a peace music festival, this flag waving was deeply offensive to Jewish people and crushingly insensitive to the plight of innocent Israelis. It can only have been perceived as support for Hamas, who, unlike some of my colleagues in the media, I'm more than comfortable calling terrorists. Those waving flags was akin to marching on the streets and cheering on Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda after 9-11. And tacit support for the evil actions of Hamas now seems to be predicated on your political leanings, particularly if you're on the left. Don't take my word for it. Here is ex-Labour MP Laura Pidcock tweeting the following. She said, I hope every single MP who consider themselves left-wing is out on the streets today in support of the Palestinians in their gravest hour. We can do without them, hiding behind the fear of Keir Starmer's reprisals. Some things are more important. Take a stand, she says. Does being left-wing now mean that you accept the decapitation of babies, the burning alive of innocent people, or the taking of a Holocaust survivor as a hostage? Is that taking one for the team? It's funny how these progressives like to call everyone they disagree with a Nazi. But when confronted with actual Nazi behaviour, there's nothing to see here. Saint Gary Lineker referenced 1930s Germany in relation to Suella Braverman's Rwanda plan, but has written not a word about these atrocities. And it's been a week now. Welcome to the selective morality of the woke left. He did retweet a mealy-mouthed statement from the Premier League, which failed to single out Hamas or directly reference innocent Israelis. Now, let me help people on both sides. Two things can be true at the same time. That Palestine should be a safe and peaceful place for everyone. And we can also say that Israel has suffered a horrific terror attack and has a right to defend itself. But sadly, in our bifurcated world where division sells, you're either one or the other. To gloss over the genocide which we saw last weekend, which has direct echoes of Adolf Hitler, and to chant about Palestine at this point in time, and the inevitable message of support it sends to those Hamas monsters, shows you the moral depravity of the be-kind crowd. Like this woman, draped in the Palestinian flag, taunting Jews about concentration camps.
Now, that was up in Glasgow. If you didn't catch what she said, she said, don't forget where you were in 1940. Ha! What about the lovely crowd outside the Sydney Opera House earlier this week, chanting, gas the Jews? In Berlin, the Mail newspaper report that the homes of Jewish people are being sprayed with the Star of David to highlight where they live. Does that sound familiar to you? The same is happening to Jewish businesses. When, it's absolutely horrific, of course. What I need to ask you, when is someone going to call out the fact that history is literally repeating itself and that it's not just being tolerated, but effectively supported by politically correct progressives. But such is the tribal echo chamber of the Church of Woke that even acts of evil against women and children and the elderly engenders zero sympathy. And what about those deluded LGBTQ plus numpties out marching on behalf of Palestine? Queers for Palestine, they cry. Well, gay, trans and non-binary people would be eliminated by Hamas faster than you can say vegan sausage roll. Why is Israel the only country in the world that gets attacked for being attacked? There's an old saying, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Well, it's worse now. The self-styled good people are not just doing nothing, they're cheering it on. Welcome to hell. Uh, your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.com. I'll get to your emails shortly. My top pundits tonight, presenter and author Tonya Buxton, former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Culvier Ranger, and GB News's senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson. Tonya, let me start with you. Your reaction to those uh, waving the flags of Palestine this week? Sickened by them. I'm, I'm absolutely sickened by them. You know, what I go to sleep, when I go to sleep at night, what I'm seeing is Noah's face, that young girl that got put onto a motorbike at that music festival and mm. taken away. I have two daughters and I go to sleep at night and I think of her face and I am sickened by this behaviour. I'm sickened by the fact that we're allowing it to continue. It has to stop. And I must add, uh, just to say, I live in North London and I've seen before, before this has even happened, I've seen the security that's needed outside Jewish schools, outside Jewish synagogues. Why should Jewish people feel unsafe in the country that they were born? Whatever said and done, we have a problem with anti-Semitism in this country. We absolutely do. And this has just shown it in big, ugly colours. We have to do something to stop this. Kulvir, can you conflate those going on a march to speak up for the Palestinian people and support for Hamas? Yes, and I think that's what's happening. And I think we need to be very clear. And those people have to be very clear. Look, oh, yes, there'll be two sides around people supporting Palestine and the views of Palestinian people. But the support is not or should not be for Hamas. And any person who comes on, and I, I, I will come to this later, but I heard the uh, ambassador to the UK of, from Palestine today on the BBC not damning Hamas. And that can't be right. This is a terrorist organisation. They've committed the worst kind of atrocities and they should be damned by everybody, including those in Palestine. And I think that's the problem here. You know, this is, this is not just an anti-Jewish thing. This is about what's wrong and right. And Hamas is wrong. You know, we can call it evil, but it is wrong. What they did was wrong. And I think anybody who is finding it hard to say that, we have to question. Indeed. And, Nigel, this is a problem for the left, isn't it? Yeah, and I'm disappointed in, in uh, some of the left who have not come out and absolutely unequivocally condemned Hamas for the atrocities they carried out. But um, it, it, there's no reason why you can't support an independent Palestinian state and still say that Hamas are evil uh, and, and are terrorists. You, you can say those things in the same breath. Mm -hmm. So I don't see, see a problem with that. If people want to come out and demonstrate for Palestine, it's rather tasteless in the current situation, mm -hmm. but it is their democratic right to do so. And uh, what do you make of Keir Starmer's reaction to the events of the last few days? 
Well, I mean, broadly, he's, there isn't a cigarette paper to put between him and Rishi Sunak. Mm. But um, what, what both the Prime Minister and, Rish, and uh, Keir Starmer are saying is that they're supporting... You nearly called uh, Starmer the Prime Minister there, by I, the I way. I always did, well, you, he you, always is. You're celebrating <laughs> early, big guy. He always is. Um, <laughs> Corvier's not happy. <laughs> but, but, but what they've been saying is that they support the idea of an independent Palestinian state mm. while condemning Hamas. That was also the statement the world leaders released, released earlier on this week. Tonya. So much for be kind. Oh, please. Th th this is the constituency on, on Twitter that we're talking about yeah. who have been silent on this terror attack on Israel. It's, it's just wrong. The, the people that are marching for Palestine, like, I, I'm a mother, so I, yeah, I'm a mother of... I can understand Palestinian mothers, I can understand Jewish mothers. Mm. I, I, I'm... My heart is clenching for what's about to happen to the Palestinian mothers. I can do that. But this is not the time to be marching for Palestine. What we are doing now is we're grieving. We're grieving for those babies that have been killed. We're grieving for those children that have been kidnapped. We are grieving for those people. That's what we're doing now. We're grieving for what happened in Israel. And this is a problem for whoever our next prime minister is, isn't it, Kulvia? Yeah. Because these tensions, I think, will only grow. They will grow, but I think we also have to look at a recent example of terror attacks. When we look at, obviously, the, the first thing that comes to mind is 7-7. Mm. Um, well, 9-11, -7, actually, sorry, before that. When that happened, the world stood with the United States. It was a terrorist attack. We didn't all go, well, hold on a minute, let's look at US foreign policy, and there's probably something there free, that we're free not Afghanistan. quite happy. Yeah. You know, we were clear the, the, the violence, the terror that occurred. This is the same, and I don't understand why it's being conflated that we can't be as clear with our condemnation of what Hamas has done and the terror that they've inflicted on Israel. Indeed, and with dark echoes of the Holocaust. Let me know your thoughts, Mark, at gbnews.com. Coming up next in the big story, whilst Israel has a right to defend itself, what will flattening Gaza and killing civilians achieve? We'll be joined by a senior Israeli military captain, and that's live in the studio. That's going to be unmissable. That's next. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified on playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour, Sunday the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. 
Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Uh, well, a big reaction to my big opinion. Uh, it's shocking that those people waving Palestinian flags in London, in Manchester and around the world are so insensitive to the plight of innocent Israelis who were killed in cold blood on the 7th of October. Well, uh, the emails are coming in thick and fast. Let's have a look at what you've got to say. Timothy says, Mark, the Marxist left have long loathed Israel because they hate the West and all it stands for. This is the left. They believe that the ends justify the means. Its hatred of Israel means support for the worst kind of anti-Semitism and anti-Western values. They are sickening, says Tim. Uh, meanwhile, Chris in Poole says, Mark, thank you for your monologue tonight. I'm sick of the BBC and other media outlets providing one-sided viewpoints about what's going on. Israel needs our unequivocal support right now. They're not getting it from the UK. Um, Richard, hi Mark. The Be Kind laptop classes are cowardly lemmings. Where is the wisdom of the tweet elite at this time? They're scared to take a lead view. They only follow once it is safe to do so. Uh, thank you so much for that. Keep those emails coming, Mark, at gbnews.com. It's time now for the big story in this evening as Israel plans to retaliate for the terror attack it suffered on the 7th of October, which has seen the deaths of over a thousand innocent people. Is flattening Gaza and raising it to the ground with the inevitable civilian deaths which will follow really the answer? Would such action be needlessly cruel and counterproductive, possibly hurting Israel? Or is the wiping out of Hamas necessary? for the very survival of the country. Well, let's speak to Captain Reserve of the Israeli Defence Forces, Eyal Baram. Uh, Captain Baram, thank you so much for joining us in the studio. First of all, can Hamas be eliminated? Is it possible? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, it's important to say, a few years ago, we saw what's happened with ISIS. Mm. ISIS was destroyed. We don't have any ISIS today in the world. And this is exactly the goal of Israel right now with Hamas. Uh, Iran founded and uh, that tried to have an Islamic caliphate all around the region. Mm -hmm. We speak about Hamas in Gaza, about Hezbollah in Lebanon, about the Syrian forces, the Iraqi forces, and of course in Yemen. Mm -hmm. And what tries to done right now by the Iranian forces in encouraging more and more areas, proxies to join. So uh, unfortunately, we had the horrible attack last week, and I heard from my friends. And unfortunately, I can say I lost nine of my friends in this horrible attack last week on the Israeli villages, and of course on the peaceful music party uh, and they mentioned to me what is the situation that they face in the moment that they enter the villages mm. after a long and intensive fight and that was of course be beheaded babies mm. and uh, women that were raped and were murdered in front of their families and more and more horrible examples that the world haven't seen since ISIS so similar for what happened in World War II when the UK attacked Nazi Germany that mm. was the only way to delete the Nazis from the world. That's what we should do right now. And I think that is why it's so important to have the back of the United Kingdom, of the United States, mm. and more and more countries that understand that this is not just a local war between Israel and the Palestinians. By the way, this is not a war with the Palestinians. This is a war, as I, as I see it, for the Palestinians people, because they are all also being hostages by Hamas, not as the 200, almost 200 Israeli citizens that took last week by Hamas forces, but mm. they are also living under a dictatorship. And we have right now a fight between the freedom side of the world, the democracy side of the world, against, of course, dictatorship and evil organizations, similar like the terror organization of Hamas. Yeah, now Israel dropped leaflets in the last few days, urging people in Gaza to head south, because there will clearly be uh, action on the ground and, and probably in the air on the northern region of, 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 the, of, of that part of, of Gaza. But inevitably civilians will die because Hamas are weaponizing civilians. I understand one of their headquarters is in the basement of a hospital. So civilians will die. Can you justify that? 
I think uh, in every war, and we saw it also fighting ISIS, uh, the world had a goal and we achieved it by uh, fighting and destroying ISIS. Similar right now, Israel has no goal, of course, and I think we, we mm. both uh, uh, agree about it, yeah. to kill citizens. But uh, of course, Hamas, uh, right now we saw pictures yesterday that Hamas themselves, they're the one who stopped their citizen going south yeah. because they want them as a human shield, of course. They, they, they actually advised uh, people in Gaza to stay in the north. Yeah, we, right, we today have been published a conversation between the Israeli Shin Bet, Israeli forces, mm. with a citizen in Gaza that said that Hamas took his keys for his car so he cannot go south. And unfortunately, the situation can be even worse, that they are threatening people for death if they will evacuate. But talking you know, specifically about targets, if one of the cells is in the basement of a hospital, are you comfortable with Israeli forces bombing that hospital? I think we should ask this question differently. Should we have a world when Hamas exists? And the answer is not. And think by doing it, of course, we should eliminate every human that is not, every citizen that is not involved in it. And Israel is doing it and did it for decades. But unfortunately, if we will not be able to understand that Hamas is using, is using mm. the civilians as a human shield, we will not be able to win this war. We will not have any goals doing it, but we will see it, unfortunately. Because I understand it's in the culture of the Israeli military to try to avoid civilian deaths. Can you give me detail, detail about how you, how you try to do that? I, I've been there firsthand. Mm. I've been there in 2014 in the war between in Israel and Gaza. That was a much minimized war just to destroy 14 talents that have the same goal for what Hamad did, did last Saturday on the 7th of October, mm -hmm. to enter a murder Israeli citizen. But then we were, we, we were able to stop it before that. And in this operation, I saw firsthand and I was also uh, briefed about it, how the IDF is dealing with citizens on the other side. They are not our enemy. We know exactly who is our enemy. But unfortunately, Hamas use it and understand that the IDF has a, high, has a high moral standards. But this, of course, moral standard is important. And we keep it. And this is our DNA. Uh, of course, similar for the United Kingdom and, of course, for any yeah. other democracy that fight against these evil forces. But we still understand but that uh, by winning this war, we'll be able to do it just by destroying the headquarters of Hamas. And that's why they decided to build it below the largest hospital in Gaza, which is the Shifa Hospital. So if you were the military commander of that operation, would you accept the bombing of a hospital to achieve the military aim? I will do all in my capacity in order to make sure that this hospital is empty for citizens. I will use the international community to force it. I will force the UN that, by the way, the UN also can help in doing it. And we see UNRWA, the organization, of course, funded and managed by the UN in Gaza. I'm not sure how are they helping right now the citizens to leave the center of Gaza. Of course, they're afraid of Hamas. But what is their goal? For why are we paying our taxes for the UN in order to help citizens and, of course, to help uh, uh, people that are not involved in this war? So I think there are much more means that the IDF use and will use. Part of them was published in order to help citizens to leave the houses and leave the central of Gaza. But of course, Hamas will do only their capacity, similar like ISIS, mm. to keep people in the houses, to keep people in the hospitals. And uh, this is, I think, right now why the international community is so important, both, of course, on bringing the hostages back to Israel. This is what we do here also in London. Mm. But uh, larger than that, in helping and pushing the every organization, including, of course, the UN and UNRWA, to make sure that they're helping citizens to live, to leave the center of Gaza and go for the south. And for my viewers and listeners, when you mentioned you're referring to the IDF, uh, that is the Israeli military, uh, which is one of the most renowned in the world. Um, the UN, you just mentioned the UN, they've condemned Israel's advice to Gazans to head south, and they've also condemned the blockade on water supplies and electricity. Is Israel breaking international law? I don't think so. I think by uh, murdering more than 1,300 citizens on one day, by raping women, by beheaded babies, I think by reading the law, this is a way of breaking the law. The reaction of Israel, and I think everyone speaks about proportions here in the UK, mm. uh, and of course the answer is Israel should not go and rape the same, the same number of women on the other side and not kill, beheaded the same number of babies. What we should do is make sure that Hamas will be destroyed. And this is, of course, not just for Israel. This is also for the safe of Europe, mm. because we learned also from the last decade that what's starting in the Middle East, similar for the a war in, in Syria, how it influenced here the citizens in the UK. And right now what we should do is to make sure that for the sake of Israel, for the sake of the Palestinians and for the sake of the entire world, there will be no organization in the world called Hamas. And all of its members, unfortunately, should die because this is for the future of our Western world, of our, our, our freedom world. And I think for having more uh, conversation like that, that cannot happen, of course, mm -hmm. in Gaza.
Uh, what would you say to those who argue the appalling attack, the terror attack by Hamas on Israel was revenge for Israel's treatment of the Palestinian people? I think they are murderers. That's the truth. If you are encouraged, and unfortunately, I've been interviewed by the BBC in the last few days. And uh, my interview, by How the way, was, go? it cut in after two minutes. You know why? Because you I, were cut. You were cut after off. two minutes. Yeah. Because when the interview was start, I just corrected them. They they said we are happy to have Al Biram, and they said about the militant attack of Hamas. And I just corrected and said, I'm sorry. This is not a militant attack. This is a terrorist attack. And every person that support right now Hamas unfortunately, is right now in the murderous list. If they do it by understanding who is Hamas and people who don't. But this is the truth. And unfortunately, in the BBC, they haven't waken up yet understanding that Hamas is also threatening the future of the United Kingdom. Why is Israel the only country in history that gets attacked when it's attacked? I don't know. Maybe because it's the easiest. I don't know. It's because this awful, well. this awful terror attack happened just over a week ago. And now Israel is somehow on the defensive. And Jewish people are facing abuse and death threats in this country and across the free world. Yep. Unfortunately, this is the situation we face right now. And this is why we all, all remember that before 6.30 in the morning on the 7th of October last Saturday, Israel had no goal entering Gaza. And of course, no goal also by destroying Hamas. We try to live with this terror organization. Uh, but as we do understand, if the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, would not be in the south, unfortunately, it took a few hours to get control and, and thousands of, of, of citizens were murdered. But if the IDF would not come there, we can just imagine what happened. The Hamas terrorists will continue to go all around Israel. And then we can imagine a story that is more similar to what's happened in the Holocaust. And this is why the Jewish people in Israelis understand that this is our... I think our hardest day and the horrible day that the Jewish people had since the Holocaust, since World War II, right now, last Saturday, 7th of October, and we remember it forever. Uh, Eyal, a privilege to have you in the studio. My heart goes out to your friends and the uh, family members impacted by, by the loss of their life in just the last few days. Nine, nine of your colleagues and friends, uh, devastating. And uh, it just demonstrates uh, really the sheer brevity and depravity of what's happening. My thanks to Captain Reserve of the Israeli Defence Forces, Eyal Biram. Well, coming up with tonight's pundits, is it wrong for modelling agencies to target refugee camps? Also, is it time to treat COVID like a cold? And is Boris Johnson's ex-wife punishing him by joining the Labour Party? That's next. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to ordinary people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes & Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides have the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians...
to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Well, a big reaction to my conversation there with a top Israeli military chief who has lost nine friends and colleagues in the last few days. Uh, Mark says, George, what's happening in Israel is really disturbing. My love and support are with them all. And what I witnessed in London yesterday on television with people wearing a poster on their backs backing Hamas is even more disturbing. Hamas threatens to wipe Israel and Jewish people off the planet. These people who are backing these terrorists, do you think they give a damn what you think because you're supporting them? God forbid if Hamas somehow did do what they say, do you really think that will be it? No, I don't, because they will, I believe, kill another nation, then the next, then the next, then the next. A powerful words there. Uh, how about Maureen, who says, Mark, I don't think that Israel will have a problem promising that they won't slit babies' throats or behead them, that they won't grab old people as hostages, that they won't grab children as hostages, that they won't use civilians as human shields, because we are not cowards like Hamas. Talk of restraint and proportionality only muddies the water. Um, thank you for your emails. Uh, last one here from Michael, who uh, actually just has a historic reference to the fact that Hamas have told people in North Gaza to stay put because clearly they want to weaponize human life. And uh, Michael says Hitler would not let his people leave Berlin when the Russian forces attacked in 1945. Well, that's been a theme of the show, hasn't it? That history is repeating itself and it's time to call it out. Now, reacting to the big stories of the day, tonight's top pundits, presenter and author Tonya Buxton, former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Culvier Ranger, He's enjoying his lordship. You can see that. He almost sits differently. And a very good friend of mine, GB News senior political commentator Nigel Nelson. Now, evidence suggests that COVID has now become yet another bug for us to contend with once winter arrives. Even the Beeb is reporting it. Of course they are. Last winter, there were estimated to be more flu deaths than COVID ones in England, just over 14,000 compared with 10,000. So is it time to treat COVID like a cold, Colvier. Yes and no, Mark, because I think at the moment there is so much anxiety that's been built up through what we've all collectively been through that it's hard to put COVID in that, that bracket of a common winter cold, or the cold, the flu, everything else that we've all been used to for generations. And I think it's more emotional and psychological than it is almost about the actual virus. I think people find it hard to understand because we, we were so pummeled with information about how deadly this virus is. And it has had a psychological effect on the collective nation. Mm -hmm. So I think even though the scientists are saying to us, you know, it may not be as bad, the, the flu is probably going to kill more people than COVID will this winter. But our collective understanding and what's seeped into our mind is to be so cautious, so scared, so you know, unwilling to bend to, to normal life, that it's going to take some time, even though, yes, COVID will probably be like a cold going forward. Nigel, we should probably have been treating COVID like a cold for the last couple of years, let alone the last couple of months. No, I don't think so. Um, 
we should start treating, treating it like flu rather than a cold, uh, because um, most of the population have been jabbed. It means that um, most people have an immunity to serious disease. I had my, my COVID jab in that arm uh, last week, and on the same day, my flu jab in that arm. I see. Um, and I think it's the Do right... Do you want to show thing. us your scar? If, if you like. I'm it. sure it's very fetching. You should have seen me 24 hours later, though. <laughs> were were you laid up in bed? You bet, yeah. yeah. Um, but when I talked to the, to the pharmacist about what was happening, he was saying that he was getting even more people coming in for the COVID jab. They liked the reassurance. So on the basis that um, we've all... It, it won't stop us catching it, but it will stop us getting serious disease. So if we now think of it... It won't as... stop you getting serious Right, disease. Tonya. I mean, just take under... it away. <laughs> okay, folks, can we... <laughs> Just, can, we, can we give Tonya the next five minutes of the yes. show? Yes, I mean we should. Have, ten. We should have always <laughs> treated COVID as it was. It's something that we needed to. If you if you were extremely obese and fat or overweight, or very old or already sick, then they're the people that should have been protected. The whole world should have continued. Our young people are still suffering, and we had a brilliant professor called Mark Antonio Sparda who came out with the COVID anxiety syndrome. And you're completely right. Um, we were lied to, and we were petrified, and our Children were psychologically played with, and they faced they faced almost zero threat from the virus. Children. Zero, zero. The, the, you know the death rate, the death age of death for COVID was and is still 82. It's older than the national age of death of no causes of no of every other cause. So it sounds so quite healthy to get COVID. 80, then. 82. It's good uh, for honestly, longevity. There you go. Honestly, and you know this. The, and, and Nigel, I, I don't take any jabs. I'll never take any jabs. The point is, is I have a good immunity. Just, do you mind sitting away from the other panelists, please? I will take. <laughs> I, have great, I have a great. I have great immunity. I tell you what I do. I look after myself. I eat good food. I make sure I'm healthy. I run. I keep my, myself healthy. I, I give my immunity, my own immunity, the tools to look after me. Have you and ever that's had what COVID? we should all be. Yes, I did have COVID. It wasn't very nice, but it wasn't as bad as when I had flu. And the point is, is that we've, we've been, that our whole society, and in particular our youths, hmm. have been fear mongered and tortured and psychologically played with. We must de treat COVID just like a normal cold and move on. Do you know what makes my mind boggle? Uh, the hysteria around COVID deaths, which I fully share because it's tragedy, a tragedy that people die from COVID. But when people die from the flu, it's not a story. No. When people die from cancer, it's not a story. A waiting list of 7.6 million people, not a story. I, I think but 180,000 yeah. people died from COVID. I, I, no, I, the, the, the jury's the, still out on that. They, a lot of them died with, not of. Yeah, I think the slight difference there, though, with, with the flu was that we understood the flu. We had data and understanding of what that virus was. The problem with COVID when it first emerged was nobody had the understanding and I think that's what led to the yes, immediate did. reaction the fear. they did and they knew that it was going down before they even put us into lockdown it was politicized it was a politicized movement unfortunately and look what it's done look what we're suffering how many young mothers died of cancer because they didn't get diagnosed mm. when they would have been yeah. 85 and died yes I, I make the choice for the young mother rather than the 85 year old okay uh, well listen you know the government are very clear and the government's top medical advisors they're very clear that the vaccine has saved many lives uh, as did lockdown Downs and other measures. Um, it's all about opinions, isn't it? Uh, what's yours, Mark, at gbnews.com? Now, Marina Wheeler, former wife of Prime Minister Boris Johnson, close friend of Colvia Ranger, she's a leading barrister and she's set to be appointed as Labour's new whistleblowing czar. Wheeler, who is an expert in employment law, is the second high profile woman from outside of the party to join Keir Starmer's team. But it begs the question is Boris Johnson's ex wife punishing him? by joining the Labour Party. Have I got any divorced people here? Yeah. <laughs> right. This is another example. <laughs> this is another example how the exes will never stop the war. Um, no, I don't think it is. <laughs> one upmanship. I don't, no, I don't think it is. That uh, I mean, Marina, w w w w the irony won't have escaped her um, that she's got a job now chasing sort of um, uh, sexual pred predators. Careful. Um, so yeah. Where's I, this going, Nigel? Well, but the other the other point is it's also a great opportunity for her. First of all, what she said is she. Practices law now she can actually change it. She's also about to work for the next prime minister, um, and it's not bad, not a bad opportunity for her to be one of his key advisors. I think she's trying I to know. wind up your old boss, Boris. 
No, I, I don't think that is. This is a bitter behaviour of someone, an ex that can't get over it. it Move on, Marina. <laughs> it depends whether she was approached for the job or she applied for it, I, I guess would be the answer. No, but in, in seriousness, uh, Marina's a very, very intelligent woman. She's a very capable barrister. Uh, and uh, as Nigel said, this is a moment for her to actually shape something that she's been passionate about all her career. Uh, I, I've known her, I've known her through the years. Uh, she's a wonderful she woman. She's always been a lefty? She's, she's always had a broader political viewpoint um, compared to where, where her, her ex-husband was. Um, but that's, that was a great balance, you know, because it's always good. You don't want your partner to agree with you 100%, otherwise it, it could be no, a bit boring. I, 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 I think it might, I mean, I mean, the cherry on the cake for her with this job is that it must really bug Boris. It's a bit, it's a bit of a mic drop, isn't it? It is. A, yeah, I think yeah, it's a very smart is. move by Sir Keir Starmer, though. He, he is um, recruiting very capable. He is because he's very, so very dull very, and has very, no idea yeah. what he's talking about. Or has no policies and doesn't know what he's doing. So what he's doing is recruiting interesting you know, women when, around when him. This Marina Wheeler. She turns up for her first day at work, and, and he'll be like, "Are you a woman or a man? I don't really know." Oh, he's going to be so confused. It's so true it, that he he won't be able to identify her. No, that's it. That's uh, the big thing. That's the, the, the big thing. There is something about warring Two exes, jobs. though, isn't there? <laughs> there is a. Is it? By the way, does it work? Can you have a relationship? in which you've got someone that's on the left and someone that's on the right. We have to ask Nigel, because yeah, I think yeah. his wife I'm, is very sensible. To, it's very true. I'm married to a Tory activist, so yes, absolutely. And you two are the dream team, but are you, are you, you know, rare in that? Is, are you a one-off? Yes. Do you need to agree with your partner, people, ideally, People politically? find it odd. Um, Claire, but we've, Claire Pearsall. But we've never argued about politics. We discuss politics endlessly all the time. We just don't argue about it. I just couldn't be married to someone who's woke. I just couldn't. It, I just want to be... Or, 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 uh, how could I be married to someone who can't tell me that I'm a woman? Yeah. Who can't identify If he doesn't as a woman? know, then no one does, do they? <laughs> Tonya, uh, brilliant stuff. <laughs> <laughs> By me. Okay, moving swiftly on. We don't do boring, do we? Not on my watch. <laughs> I just won't have it. Now, coming up in my take at 10, looking forward to this, as the country's former top banker says the push to decarbonise is getting too expensive, the crazy dream of net zero is running out of gas. But first, after a number of their stars back Hamas and they refuse to call them terrorists, have the BBC let Britain down over their Israel stance? Plus, I've been asking, uh, is it time to treat Covid like a cold? That is tonight's People's Poll. The results are in. I shall reveal all next. We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Second best. Wow, yeah. that least, You interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour, Sunday the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now, in the course of today, I've been conducting an exclusive Mark Dolan Tonight People's Poll. I've been asking, is it time to treat COVID like a cold? Well, almost 85% have said yes and 15% say no. The people have spoken. Now, the BBC is embroiled in an impartiality row after its journalists appeared to justify the killing of Israeli civilians by Hamas. The corporation said it was urgently investigating after social media activity by several of its journalists in the Middle East appeared to celebrate the attack, which left approximately 1,300 people dead. Reporters at BBC News Arabic endorsed comments likening Hamas, which is a designated terror group, to freedom fighters, as well as describing the October the 7th atrocity as a morning of hope. One senior correspondent appeared to make fun of the Israeli relatives of a grandmother who was abducted by Hamas, whilst another tweeted that Israel's prestige is crying in the corner. Meanwhile, the Beeb is under pressure uh, to describe Hamas as a terror organisation, with the Conservative MP Michael Fabricant raising this issue in a letter to the broadcast regulator Ofcom. So is the BBC letting the country down with its approach to reporting on Israel. To debate this, let's go live to former BBC News producer John Mayer and social worker and political commentator, a good friend of Mark Dolan tonight, a regular panellist, Yosef David. Um, Yosef, let me ask you, why is it so important for the BBC to call Hamas terrorists? Well, the BBC is known the world over, for some reason that I cannot understand, as an organisation uh, which can be trusted to provide critical analysis and accurate information. And it's simply not accurate to refer to Hamas as anything else other than a terrorist organisation. We have to ask ourselves, what happened last week? What did Hamas do? Did they walk to the border fence with their hands held high saying, I, we can't take this anymore? Did they try to hold land? Did they go to try and see uh, areas of interest for Palestinians? Or did they go and savagely kill people with the hope, probably, of destabilizing regional peace negotiations, but certainly with the aspiration of terrifying millions of Israelis and people across the world? That is the definition of terrorism. That is trying to achieve your political aims through violence. There is no other way to describe Hamas other than a terrorist organization. Uh, John Mayer, the BBC say that they don't want to take sides. They talk about the importance of neutrality. But by not calling Hamas terrorists, perhaps they are taking a side. No, they're not. They're absolutely spot on to do that. The BBC, if anything, is about impartiality, due impartiality, not taking sides. If next week, when Israel invades Gaza, and maybe they do acts that they shouldn't do, well, should the BBC call them terrorists? Because, you know, what, what is terrorism? What is state terrorism? Is, is Russia terrorist in, in Ukraine? You know, is, it, was, was Israel, were the Israeli freedom fighters terrorists in 1948? What is a terrorist? You know, I, I, when I was a producer, found myself in, in, in the 2010 election talking down talkback to Martin McGuinness, who was, you remember, with all, the with deputy all respect, chief of staff of the IRA. With all due and respect, he, murdering I called innocent him people in their homes yes, because of terrorism. Yosef, what was What's your that? point? Ros could you say what you... Could you repeat that, please, Yosef? With all due respect, murdering innocent people in their homes with the hope of affecting a political outcome is terrorism. 
Now, people have said it shouldn't be the government's position to tell a free broadcaster how to refer Absolutely. to either militants or terrorists. You shouldn't need a government intervention to tell you that what we saw was heinous terrorism. All you need are a set of eyes and a conscience. Yes. Uh, John Mayer, what is militant about beheading a baby? I would argue that by not calling Hamas terrorists, the BBC are gaslighting innocent Israeli victims. Yeah. Absolutely disgusting. Of course it's disgusting. But don't forget, Hamas are an elected government in Gaza. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not freelance terrorists. So what happens next week if Israel go, goes into Gaza and actually commits acts of what you might call terrorism? Should the BBC call them terrorists? Uh, what was the John, last election John, in Gaza? John, can I ask you about al-Qaeda? Did the BBC describe them as terrorists? Did they, did they describe Osama bin Laden as a terrorist? Uh, I'm afraid they didn't. The BBC has, as you know, st strict guidelines on this. They don't use the word terrorist in their reporting. They don't mind other people using the word terrorist, and they will use that. But BBC journalists are not allowed to use the word terrorist, and they're absolutely spot on on this. And don't, we don't get bullied by, by the government, by anybody else. You know, the BBC should hold a line. It's an impartial broadcaster. There you go, uh, Yosef, it's impartiality and the, the BBC are bound by journalistic convention and the rules. I would say that the BBC are a collection of centrist ideologues who unfortunately can't see the wood for the trees anymore and don't represent the interests of the British people. It is in the interest of the British people to have accurate information. And if something is palpably a terrorist attack condemned by nations across the world, the BBC has a duty to present the facts as they are. And it's simple that which, which they have. They in have. a heinous just, way. I, I don't believe so. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the BBC, yesterday. with respect... Uh, with John, respect, John, let yourself finish. The yeah, BBC right. has known... Have known have, the BBC have known the modus operandi of Hamas since they came into power in the early 2000s. I read BBC articles highlighting that gay people had been murdered, that people had been tied to motorbikes and okay. dragged through the roads, that, that Israelis had been murdered. So the, this is not something new. The BBC know what Hamas is, and the BBC must bear some responsibility for some degree of the community relations in this country by not presenting the facts as they are and presenting this moral relativism, which I'm Unfortunately, is it, it, it's simply nonsense. OK, uh, the clock's against us. Uh, John, John, last word to you. Who did the Palestinians demonstrate against yesterday? Who did they throw, throw paint at? The Palestinian supporters in London. They threw paint at the BBC. So you were throwing, you were throwing verbal paint. The, the Palestinians are throwing red paint. The BBC has to be in the middle of all that. And as far as I can see, they're doing a bloody good job in reporting that war. My thanks to former BBC News producer John Mayer and social worker and political commentator Yosef David, who, producer Maria tells me, is joining us on the sofa on Friday. Looking forward to that. Coming up in the 10 o'clock hour, tomorrow's paper's hot off the press. And in my take at 10, as the country's former top banker says the push to decarbonise is getting too expensive, the crazy dream of net zero is running out of gas. Do you see what we did there? It's gas, it's net zero, it's fuel. This show, let me tell you, isn't just thrown together. So I'll be dealing with the eco-maniacs after this short intermission. Who is it? We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. Yeah. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday, the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel.
People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon, on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 pm, Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB, on the smart speaker app, and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. It might take a 10 as the country's former top banker says the push to decarbonise is getting too expensive. The crazy dream of net zero is running out of gas. As Germany sparks an EU civil war by offering the UK a new trade deal, is Britain having the last laugh? Plus, are the government right to keep petty criminals out of prison and reform them instead? Who better to ask than tonight's newsmaker, former prisons minister, politics legend, Anne Widdicombe? She'll be very triggered by the sight of those EU flags. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from my top pundits. So a packed show, lots to get through. I will be dealing with the eco-maniacs, but first, the news and Polly Middlehurst. Mark, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the top story tonight is that the US Secretary of State says the Egyptian-controlled Rafa border crossing should reopen. Some reports suggesting 9 o'clock in the morning local time. That's 11 o'clock our time for aid to pass through into Gaza. We're also hearing that some Palestinians with dual nationality will also be able to pass through the checkpoint. Anthony Blinken said the US is working with Egypt, Israel and the United Nations to get assistance through to Gazans. Hundreds of tonnes of aid from several countries have been waiting in Egypt's Sinai Peninsula, pending a deal for its safe delivery into Gaza, together with the evacuation of some foreign passport holders through the crossing. Egypt said it had stepped up diplomatic efforts to break the impasse. Meanwhile, Israeli troops are now massing at the Gaza border in preparation for an Israeli ground assault. And the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has vowed to demolish Hamas. Anthony Blinken says the U.S. will continue to stand with Israel. What we're actually doing, including the deployment of these aircraft carrier uh, battle groups. Uh, again, not to provoke anyone, but to, to send a very clear message of, of deterrence, that no one should do anything that widens this conflict in any way or that furthers aggression against Israel from any other direction. Well, in the meantime, the Prime Minister and King Abdullah of Jordan have been speaking about diplomatic efforts to prevent further escalation in the wider Middle East conflict. Earlier, Rishi Sunak welcomed King Abdullah to Downing Street. The leaders also agreeing on the importance of taking measures to protect civilians in Gaza, 
including British and Jordanian dual citizens caught up in the violence. This comes after a fervid round of crisis talks by world leaders with others as they try to inject diplomacy into the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Meanwhile, four government flights carrying Britain's left Israel today, two more expected tonight. The Foreign Office is telling British nationals in Gaza to be ready to get out in case the Rafah border crossing with Egypt is opened in the morning. It's currently the only route out of the territory. And the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, said the UK is doing everything it can to get British people out. Here in London, hundreds of people gathered at a vigil today to commemorate Israeli victims of the Hamas terror attack. Holding Israeli flags high and bearing posters saying, bring them home, people handed out flyers featuring names and faces of those taken hostage by Hamas. A strong police presence patrolled the event which took place in Parliament Square in central London. Now, away from the Israeli-Hamas conflict and onto sport, England are through to the last four of the Rugby World Cup after an astonishing 30-24 victory over Fiji in their quarter-final in Marseille. Lusty voices singing the national anthem and Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, seen there watching from the stand supporting England. It means we're through now to the semis for the second World Cup in a row. Steve Bothwick's men will now face South Africa in the tournament semi-finals on Saturday. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. This is Britain's news channel. Thanks, Polly, and well done, England. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight as Germany sparks an EU civil war by offering the UK a new trade deal. Is Britain having the last laugh? Plus, are the government right to keep petty criminals out of prison and reform them instead? I'll be asking former prisons minister and politics legend Anne Widdicombe. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from my top pundits. Tonight, presenter and author Tonya Buxton, former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Kulveer Ranger, and GB News's senior political commentator, the very happily married Nigel Nelson. They'll be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros of the day. So a packed hour to come. Those papers are on their way, but first, my take at 10. Net zero? Net so much. The former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, has said that reducing carbon emissions will involve exceptionally expensive costs in a world of lower growth and higher debt, making it harder to transition to net zero. He said a weak global economy, higher inflation and the conflict in Ukraine, plus the Middle East conflict, had thrown the world into an age of uncertainty. No shit, Sherlock. Let's be honest, the flame on this project is flickering. Candle in the wind turbine. After Rishi Sunak identified concerns among voters about the growing cost of this wild experiment, he announced a major slowdown in the race to zero emissions. Emmanuel Macron in France, a guy for whom I'm growing a lot of respect, recently said that Europe has done enough for now and worse polluters must do the heavy lifting. How right he is. The public around the world, and now finally our leaders, are growing tired of the hot air from climate activists. No one's got the money for electric cars, which leave you beset with range anxiety if you're going anywhere further than your local Tesco. And heat pump boilers are an expensive nightmare, costing tens of thousands of pounds. They're inappropriate for many properties, and they don't actually make the water very hot. Insulating the country is a lovely idea, but it will cost billions that we don't have. Where would you cut elsewhere? The NHS? Schools? Policing? Good luck with that. Net zero is going the way of the COVID lockdowns. An abject and financially ruinous failure. A car crash in slow motion. A globalist wet dream which is collapsing under the weight of its own rhetoric. 
Politicians have not been straight with the public about the cost of net zero, with Conservative estimates suggesting every UK household would have to find up to £15,000 between now and 2030 to fund this wild experiment. Now, my brilliant colleague Melissa asked me today in the meeting why I use the word experiment. A great question. Because we don't know, despite the eye-watering cost, whether all of this will even work. We don't know whether windmills, solar panels and wave technology are ever going to fulfil our energy needs or produce a drop in the world's temperature, especially with our contribution to emissions being a measly 1%. It's all a massive punt, and it's our money and our way of life that they're gambling with. And what a sick joke it is that the Green Lobby stopped us building nuclear power stations 20 years ago. And what a pathetic spectacle it is that Britain does a deal to import shale gas from America, even though we have large amounts of coal, gas, oil, and yes, even shale on our own shores. The scientific case for net zero is flaky at best. Look at Germany, who have spent 10 years investing billions in green renewables and yet found themselves reliant on Vladimir Putin's gas to keep the lights on. The Germans, and I'm not making this up, you won't believe this, the Germans are currently tearing down windmills so they can reopen coal mines. You're welcome. And the economic case for net zero is dead too because it was only going to work in an environment of low interest rates where debt is cheap. Well, that era, like Madonna's career, is behind us. The International Energy Agency estimates that achieving net zero emissions by 2050 will require additional investment of up to $2.5 trillion globally over the next 10 years and the rest. By which time, we'll all be living outside in tent cities, reading by candlelight, eating cockroach soup, and selling our firstborn to the highest bidder. The cosy green consensus is crumbling. Net zero has run out of money, run out of public support, and run out of steam. In the end, it's just been another liberal progressive vanity project, which is doomed to fail. Go woke, no smoke. Net zero, more like never zero. Your reaction, especially if you disagree, mark at gbnews.com. I'll get to your emails shortly, the most important part of the show. But let's hear from my brilliant pundits as well. Presenter and author, Tonya Buxton. Tonya, great to have you back on Mark Dolan tonight. Former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Culver Ranger, and GB News's very own senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson. He's on the payroll. There is no escape. Uh, Nigel, can I start with you? The race for net zero is rather slowed down and it's come to a spluttering halt. It's certainly slowed down. I mean, Keir Starmer, Keir Starmer has actually um, uh, put back his 28 billion for green projects in Britain. Uh, so that was a disappointment. Uh, Rishi Sunak has, has uh, uh, put back targets that were necessary to achieve it. Another disappointment. But it really is urgent we do something about it. We've had the the. Um, uh, hottest day on record in July, the hottest June month ever. We've got sea ice in uh, the Antarctic, which is melting uh, at the rate of uh, 10 times the size of Britain. It is actually urgent to do this. And if we're worried about the cost, we have to think about getting it out of general taxation so low-income people aren't hit with the kind of figures that you, that you mentioned there. Uh, of course, that means raising taxes. The parties say they won't do that. So we're backing away from something that was so serious that we needed to actually get something done, get something moving. Um, we're responsible not for 1% of, uh, of emissions. We're responsible for 10%. Where would you get that from? The, the Industrial Revolution. Revolution, because the Industrial Revolution is... The, is do, do you want to... Nigel, do you want to lump that in with uh, reparations for slavery as well? Uh, what, what else should we atone <laughs> yeah, for? I think that think? Let, let me make a list of things we've got to apologise for, no, including actually, basically no, giving the world electricity yeah, I wasn't, and the I wasn't steam engine. I apologising for the Industrial Revolution, just pointing out... Um, that it was because of it that our emissions are worth about 10% of where we are at the, at the moment. You. You, you've Something been using Jimmy Carr's tax just accountant... Fact. Sorry, I missed that. You've been using Jimmy Carr's tax accountant. You've been cooking the books. 10%, <laughs> do me a favour. The bottom line is Britain is one of the cleanest economies in the world. We're number eight for manufacturing, 1% of global emissions right now. 
Well, OK, and, and you would be right that um, uh, India and China, uh, small changes there are better than big changes here. That will do more for the climate. But the whole point is, this is a world problem. We all have to get together to solve that. Well, there you go. I'm glad Nigel said that, because, uh, Tonya, I don't think that this is a world problem. I think it's a China problem, an India problem, an America problem, a Brazil problem, not a British problem. I completely agree with you. What is a British problem is that we are being sunk into poverty. People can't afford to pay for their houses, for their heating, for anything else because of this ridiculous policy of net zero. It's got to stop. And thank goodness, sense is, is coming through now. We're going to stop this rubbish. And the bottom line, Kulveer, is that this is going to help Rishi Sunak at the next election because my viewers and listeners do not want the country or themselves to be made poorer for what is if we're honest, an experiment. Well, I, I think the challenge here is that whenever there are good times, and you highlighted it when there's low interest rates and there's maybe money around, you know, politicians look at these things and go, we can afford to do it, and the public feel that they can afford to do it. But as soon as the economy gets tight, we get a recession, you know, we tighten our purse strings, we start cancelling infrastructure projects, we start wondering, well, why are we doing these things and what impact they will have? Now. I'm not a climate change denier. I do believe that we do have to do something. I do believe pumping out you know, dirty fuel is not going to be the answer for sure. the future. But here, here. it's about how do we invest in the right way? Because actually, when, um, actually, when the former mayor, Boris Johnson, asked me to take on the environmental brief, which I didn't really want at the time because I didn't think that was the right way to do things, he was very clear, and I was very clear, we took an economic view on these policies. Yeah. How could we create jobs? Where was the industry going? Why would we want to build electric vehicles? Because we'd want to sell them to the rest of the world as well. So there's, we've got to look at it through the way of doing good for the economy, for people, costing us less, and good for the environment. And I think that's the win-win that we should be focusing on. I love my pundits tonight. They're coming in hot, and they return at 10.30 with tomorrow's papers. But next, as Germany sparks an EU civil war by offering the UK a new trade deal, is Britain having the last laugh? Plus, are the government right to keep petty criminals out of prison and reform them instead? I'll be asking former prisons minister and politics legend Anne Widdicombe. She's next, and she's not happy. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to ordinary people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes & Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching.
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Are the BBC letting down Britain with their Israel stance? Uh, Lynn says, Mark, for me, the proof of terrorism is that Hamas killers will not wear a uniform and face their adversary like a true soldier. The BBC has a report, uh, excuse, forgive me, the BBC has a duty to report the truth, not their own truth. Uh, Terry says, Mark, the BBC has lost its reputation as a world news authority by still pushing the same stories as other legacy news outlets. Um, Tony says, good evening, Mark. Uh, it shows what the BBC are when they call the Dam Busters raid infamous. Helen says, Mark, it could be claimed that taking sides would be to side with either Palestinians or Israelis. You cannot say uh, that you could take sides between Hamas and Israel. The BBC are a disgrace. Um, but look, there are a few people that disagree and want to back up the BBC. Peter says, Mark, the BBC must not take sides, otherwise it, its output will lose trust, says Peter. Um, Linda, uh, we've done Linda, haven't we? Uh, let's just finish with John, who I think strikes the right notes. John says, Mark, we must realise, we must realise that Hamas is a terrorist organisation. The Palestinian people are a peace-loving community who don't want violence just to get on with their lives. Well, isn't that what we all want? Thank you for your emails. We'll get to more shortly. Mark at gbnews.com. Always the best part of the show when you get in touch. The second best part is this. Yes, the newsmaker and the German finance minister, Christian Linder, has sparked an EU civil war by inviting the UK to take new steps on a new and improved trade deal with the bloc. He even goes as far as to say, call us. However, this offer has sparked outrage from some of his EU counterparts who say Germany cannot make this offer without member agreement. So, are the EU missing us? And is post-Brexit Britain having the last laugh? Let's ask the former government minister, best-selling author and television personality, Anne Widdicombe. And how much is the EU missing Britain, do you think? Oh, I think it's missing us quite considerably. I think it's missing our contribution. Uh, I think it's just missing our general uh, participation. Uh, but tough luck. Uh, and what strikes me about this is Germany wouldn't, out of the goodness of its heart, uh, make offers to Britain for Britain's sake. This is Germany saying, oh, dear, you know, we're not doing so well out of this Brexit business. Perhaps mm -hmm. we should try uh, to swing it a little more our way. I mean, that is effectively what's going on. And yes, we should all be laughing at that. Well, yes, the Germans would like to sell us more of their Mercedes Benz and BMWs and their, uh, their low and brow lager, wouldn't they? Well, of course they would. There is no country in the world that doesn't want to sell more of its own products. You know, Germany's not an exception to that, but it's feeling the draft since we've left. And could I indulge in a conspiracy theory with you? I just wonder whether in five to ten years' time, the EU will be so desperate to have us back, they'll say, you know what, you can have the old deal and we'll get you back in. No Schengen, no Euro, maybe even a cap on free movement. Is that possible? No, that's not possible, and I think we all know that. Um, and indeed, I think we would need to be very, very wary, because we saw where it led last time. So I think the only sensible answer to that would be no. I mean, my actual fear in all of this is not Germany, it's not the EU, it's Keir Starmer, who has said in terms, and this is probably what has encouraged Germany, he said in terms that he wants to negotiate a better deal. Now, a better deal actually means, of course, uh, you know, the single market or the customs union or mm. further regulation or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, the deal is not going to work solely in our favour. 
you know, we haven't got a particularly good deal at the moment. Let's not make it any worse. However, Anne, well, Keir Starmer is very clear he does not want Britain to go back into the single market or join a customs union. Uh, he wants British retailers to be able to sell more of our goods to the EU. I mean, surely he's right to push for that uh, improved deal, don't you think? I think he should leave it to businesses to export their, uh, their goods to the EU and to sell their goods into the EU uh, because they happen to know what they're doing. Don't be fooled by this business of, you know, Keir Starmer doesn't want to rejoin, Keir Starmer doesn't want the formal single market, he doesn't want the formal customs union. There are two ways of doing it, as I've said before. One is to actually re-enter, which we'll never do. But the other is simply to align ourselves so much with the EU that we are still under their dictation. And that is what is going on. We should be completely free to do what we want to do. And above all, we should be doing it uh, which Hunt and Shunak are not. I tend to agree with you. I think if Labour gets in, it will be death by a thousand cuts to Brexit. Um, and what about the UK and the EU, though? Perhaps many would argue that we're missing them, are we? No, I don't think we're missing them at all. Uh, it doesn't appear to have impacted on our growth rates. It hasn't impacted on our inflation rates. So, of course, other things have. Mm. Uh, it, it hasn't made any difference to us. Uh, and we could be so much stronger if we did what they were dreading, and they must be laughing up their sleeves at us. They were dreading us becoming some sort of Singapore on Thames, that is to say, mm. really competitive with them. Uh, and Hunt made it very clear in his very first budget he wasn't going to do that at all. We were just going to align ourselves with their rates of corporation tax, their this, their the other thing. We haven't torn up all the regulations that we were promised were going to be torn up. Uh, it is a complete shambles. And I don't mind a shambles. I've come to expect that from a Conservative government. What I mind is a shambles that is against British interests. Well, I agree with you, Anne. Last night on the show, I was saying that we've got to love bomb the rich because we need their money, we need their investment. <laughs> Singapore on Thames, bring it on, Anne. Um, Anne, can I Hi. take you now to your Home Office brief? where you served with such distinction as prisons minister. The Justice Secretary, Alex Chalk, has announced less prison time for minor offenders in order to tackle overcrowding and to help low-level criminals rehabilitate rather than learn the tricks of the trade inside. Now, you are a great champion of rehabilitation. Is this a good move? No, because prisons are meant to rehabilitate. Prisons have two aims. One is to keep people safe in custody so that the public are protected. The other is, and I quote, to prepare them to lead law-abiding lives, both in prison and afterwards. Now, that mission statement is displayed in our prisons, and uh, I therefore draw your attention to help them to lead law-abiding lives. There is no conflict between prison and rehabilitation. Prison should, should automatically be focused on rehabilitation. One of our big problems is that it isn't. All this is is the government saying, oh dear, we've got a mess. Uh, we haven't got enough prison places. We haven't provided for them. We don't want to provide them. We'd rather people didn't go to prison. It's the road that Labour went down before them. And it is an irresponsible road from the point of view of the public. Do you think our prisons will be overflowing for the foreseeable future, Anne? Unless the government takes some emergency action, which can be done, mm. um, and then if they put, you know, they can bring in, <coughs> sorry, they can bring in Bless temporary you. accommodation. They can put it down in uh, Category C prisons, which is what I did when I had to find extra prison places. I even brought in a ship. All sorts of things that wow. they can do. Let them get on and do it. I did it. They can do it. And it's always the highlight of the weekend to have you on. We'll see you next Sunday. And I know you've got a little bit of a cold there, so thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you in a week's time. Uh, the politics legend that is Anne Whitaker. What a trooper, by the way. All these people calling in sick go, sorry, boss, I can't come in today. Look at Anne. She's firing on all cylinders. She's got a cold. She's got COVID. She's got the flu. She's got it all. But she still addresses the nation via Mark Dolan tonight. Look, I hope she hasn't got COVID, and I do wish her well. Don't you just love Anne? Right, folks, lots more to come. The papers are on their way. Uh, some strong headlines. Plus, my pundits will be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros. And what about this as a question for you? As Germany sparks an EU civil war by offering the UK a new trade deal, is Britain having the last laugh? The results are in. I shall reveal all next. Who is it? 
We're here for the show. More energy this time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. Wow, yeah. that least, Dima. You interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday, the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Pretty mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now, today, we've been asking the great British public, as Germany sparks an EU civil war by offering the UK a new trade deal, is Britain having the last laugh? Well, the results are in. I think we might have Amy at the, uh, the, old, uh, the old little graphic to pop up there. Uh, Greg, have we got the numbers? Give me the numbers. How many people think Britain is having... Oh, there you go. Look at that. 81% of GB News viewers think that Britain is having the last laugh when it comes to Brexit. Who knew? And 18% just over say no. It's a landslide, isn't it? By anyone's metric. Uh, it is 10.30, so it's time for this. OK, let's go to The Guardian newspaper. US in last-ditch effort to reduce impact of Israeli assault on Gaza. Journalist 83 among 126 confirmed hostages. Uh, the I newspaper now. US and UK in race who try to prevent Israel conflict spreading. The US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Rishi Sunak are leading diplomatic efforts to try and prevent Israel's campaign in Gaza spreading across the region. The PM met Jordan's King Abdullah at Downing Street to discuss the crisis and will hold further talks with regional leaders in the next 48 hours. The US has warned Iran over any potential escalation of the conflict as Blinken visits Egypt on the latest stop of a whirlwind tour of Arab countries. Humanitarian crisis in Gaza is worsening, say the the I newspaper with Israel warning it's set to launch a major offensive by land, sea and air in response to the Hamas attacks. 
Metro now. Madonna is back. How dare I besmirch her name in my take at 10. Her career is on fire. In fact, she's getting five-star reviews, so well done to Madge. Queen of Pop gets into the groove as she kicks off her world tour. Israel kicks, excuse me, Israel kills mastermind of massacre. Um, Hamas terror chief dies in retaliation air bombardment. Blitz on Gaza goes on as Israel prepares for a land invasion. Financial Times, US warns Iran not to escalate Gaza war into a broader Middle East conflict. Good luck with that. The Times newspaper, England power through and set up a semi-final against South Africa. Pop-up cells in jail yards to tackle overcrowding. Pop-up prison cells, deporting foreign criminals and making low-level um, offenders remove graffiti will be the centre of a plan to overhaul sentencing and ease prison overcrowding. A topic I discussed with Anne Whittacombe just a few minutes ago. A million try to flee as invasion of Gaza looms is the other story in The Times. Daily Express now. Home Secretary vows police will pursue anyone mocking the murder of Jews. Suella's stark warning to those who glorify terrorism. The Home Secretary pledged, the police are coming for you if you glorify terror on Britain's streets. Also, immigration to stay high for the rest of the decade. Daily Mirror. Madge, the magic and mayhem on tour. OK, let's have a look at the Independent story. I'll get you the graphic for that mirror story in just a moment. Um, how about this from the Independent? Israeli tanks mass on border ahead of imminent invasion. Military to attack by land, sea and air as evacuation deadline expires. UN aid agency warns that Gaza is being pushed into an abyss. Israeli defence forces confirm 126 hostages are being held by Hamas. Um, I'll bring you the mirror shortly when we have it, but let's get reaction now from my fantastic pundits. I'm delighted to welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight, presenter and author Tonya Buxton, a very old friend of mine, former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Coolvier Ranger, and GB News' very own senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson. Delighted to say that Greg and Amy now have the mirror for us, so let's fire it up if we can. I want to bring you all the front pages as and when we have them. There you go. OK, sorry, folks, we're having a few technical issues, but we will get you the mirror very shortly because it's always worth a read, and it's Israel, unsurprisingly. Right, uh, listen, we've got lots to discuss, and I want to ask you, Kulvir, how Israel go about balancing revenge with humanitarian considerations? How do you square that circle? It's, it's a very difficult challenge for Israel. You can sense, obviously, the emotion here um, and the need <coughs> for them to do something for their people. But I think the word that we're looking for, or the rest of the international community is looking for, is de-escalation. How do we get back from this brink? Now, the challenge is that there are hostages involved. Those, that's probably the first priority for Israel, the government. How do they get their people back? The second is obviously taking out Hamas. They need to do something about Hamas. But the question is about the civilian impact that there will be when this, if this happens. And I think we've seen this every hour, every minute, every day that goes by, that you don't get the full-scale invasion. I think the international community is working with Israel to see what else can be done. Obviously, I say in that order, though, hostages, Hamas, you know, destruction as, as much as possible, and then protecting civilian life. But Nigel, who is anyone to tell Israel not to defend themselves and to retaliate after an appalling attack? Well, I mean, everyone has said that, that Israel has a right to defend themselves. What I think all the front pages are reflecting and what um, uh, America, Britain and the West is doing is trying to keep the conflict contained as much as possible. Now, obviously, one of the ways of doing that is, is to try and get Israel back from the brink. Um, that Hamas may have, may have slaughtered innocent Israelis, but it won't help hugely to massacre uh, innocent Palestinians either. So the key for the West is keep Iran out. Mm. Iran, it, 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 Israel, Israel's greatest fear has always been Iran. I mean, they live in a country which is like being on a housing estate where everyone wants to throw a brick through your window. Mm. They, they're surrounded by Hormsley, enemies. basically, or perhaps Upper Islington, yeah. <laughs> Could be. Um, but Iran is, the, is their biggest fear. And there's always, when you go to Israel, there's this sense of impending catastrophe hanging over the country. Yeah, for sure. But look, the bottom line is that won't wash with ordinary Israeli people, will it? The idea of a de-escalation. They want to see the end of Hamas. 
They, they absolutely do want to see the end of Hamas. M my concern is that these corridors for the people to get out uh, are not efficient enough and there's not been enough help to get Palestinian, innocent Palestinian families, children out. That's what really worries me. Yeah. I, I, I can't see how the Israelis won't bomb the hell out of the place and they'll be killing so many innocent people if we can't get these Palestinians out. And Hamas is blocking them from going out. Of course. And that's the worst of it, that these people are... are they're, they're just being held ransom. I think just, just to add, though, Mark, so it, it's not just, you know, the Palestinian civilians. The cost of Israeli lives of going into Gaza will mm. be immense as well. Mm. Obviously, there will be casualties on both sides. Israeli soldiers, they'll be going to terrain that has been prepared for them, you know, to not be able to attack on. The, the, the Hamas will have set this, we'll be trapped it up, you know, they'd have been prepared for this. So there'll be a terrible cost for Israeli life as well, if they go in. Well, so, we've, you know, there's indeed. a lot to be lost but on But I just both wonder, sides. Kulvia, whether the Israelis and the Israeli military and, and the, you know, the people, the politicians, they see this as an existential moment for their country and therefore they will die. I think that's, willing that's right. To. And, and we've got to understand that. We who, you know, sit back slightly dispassionately, obviously seeing the terror that's being inflicted on Israel, it's easy for us to say, well, well, let's calm down here. Obviously, the Israelis need and have to have some kind of closure or some kind of action to deal with the, the impact. Terror. The, the, the terror. The, the terror. The terrorism terror, that they have faced. It. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. But, it, was, but, it was horrific. But what is the further impact going to be? We're, we're, you know, we talked about what is the next state that they will enter into. And I think that, that where we have a little bit of time passing with each day, I think that's the conversations that are probably going on with Israel, say, OK, where do we go after the next act? after this next moment. In a developing story, I can tell you that uh, we're hearing NBC, the US news network, are saying that the Rafa border will open at 9 a.m. tomorrow to allow civilians through. Let's hope that is the case. Uh, but the issue that Israel have is it is about their future, isn't it, Tonya? Uh, it is about revenge, and it's about the fact that Hamas don't follow the rules. Hamas so are therefore, evil. They are the evil on earth. Yeah. That's what they are. They are yeah, evil So you can't, people. you know, we're talking there about, no... we're talking about not, not inflaming the situation. You can't negotiate with, with Hamas. You can't negotiate with people that slit the throats of babies. Mm. You, you just, you just can't. It's, it's game over. They are evil. So here's the ultimate dilemma, and this is a dilemma facing the Israeli military as we speak. Uh, let's imagine you have, and you do have, Hamas cells, terror cells, headquartered in the basement of hospitals. Do you bomb that hospital? See, that's the, that's the choice that I just couldn't make because m my heart is bleeding for the innocent Palestinians. The, the Israeli general that I spoke to in the studio, he said, he just gave me a bit of a politician's answer, but he, he said, obviously, you do what you can to vacate that hospital, but in the end, Hamas must be eliminated. I, I think the challenge is, I, I think none of us are military experts yeah. on this, but. I'd say don't do what your enemy is trying to get you to do. I think that's probably where we have to get to here. There will be other routes, hopefully, for Israel and the international community to do what we need to do with Hamas. What, Look are, how those, we went what are those routes? I well, mean, look, I feel you're perhaps looking through rose-tinted spectacles. Well, well, as long as Hamas are in Gaza running the place, Israel are under threat. And I think that's what Israel needs to get from the international community. What support are they going to get in different means to tackle what Hamas? What would that be? I mean, you what, can't really what, do sanctions on Hamas. No, no, no I, I, th I think this is, this, is, this is covert, you know, insurgent operations, military, that go in and take these people out. But with more precision, potentially. But you, you have to actually establish what Hamas's end game was in the first place. We know that the, 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 this attack was planned for meticulously too, Correct. for at least a year. What Hamas knew that the, the result of that would be an invasion of Gaza. So the question really is, what does Hamas think they're doing? And that's what it, my, my point about Iran. Iran seems to be the wild card here and the biggest danger. Mm -hmm. I can't see that Hamas would actually want to destroy their own communities unless they had a bigger picture ready to go. I don't think you can rationalise Hamas's view here. I don't think there's a rational argument to where they're trying to get to. I think this is, you know, where um, they take an action because they decide that's what you're going to do. Somehow it goes through their leadership 
and they think that's the right thing to do, but there is no end state that they're looking at because the, you know, their view of a destruction of the state of Israel is just not going to happen. Well, then we're left with sort of um, Israel trying to outcraze the crazies. No, we're looking at an international community that deals with this cancer of Hamas and cuts it out, much like we had to do with al-Qaeda. I mean, it is the hospital question, isn't it? It is. You can't skirt around it. If there is a terror cell headquartered in a hospital, do you bomb that hospital? And that is the question. I'd love to know what you think, Mark, at gbnews.com, uh, rather them than me having to make that judgment. Um, folks, uh, let's get on to a bit of jolly politics, shall we? Uh, public wants a spring election next year, says a poll in the I newspaper. What do you think? Uh, you're ready for an election, Nigel. You're I'm ready always for it. on I'm, a war footing. I am ready for you're, it. You're yeah. always on manoeuvres. Uh, what do you think? A spring poll. That way, the Prime Minister looks like he's owning the agenda. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think spring is a, is a possibility. I know that Number 10 have been preparing for it, um, that uh, local authorities have been asking parish councils what is the availability of polling stations in May, and... These are, these are councils which aren't having local elections next year, so there's got to be a reason for that. At the moment, the, the only way the PM can go is when the, the, the news is good. Um, if things are looking good by May, he goes. If not, end of the year. I've been calling for a spring election for quite a while because I think it gives uh, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, a chance to look like he does own the agenda, that he's not clinging on for dear life, Colvier. I think it's a bold message of confidence. I'm going early because I believe in myself, I believe in my party, and I believe in my country. Yeah, there's, there's lots of tactics. And it sounds like you're doing some speech writing there for a potential <laughs> prime ministerial <laughs> cam campaign. Rishi. Yeah, I'll, I'll step in, yeah. in emergency. So, um, do you know, I did offer to present this morning when they were having the Schofield problems. I don't mind running the country for a couple of months. Okay. I'll clear it with the bosses here. Yeah. yeah and well, you know what? I'll be led by emails from my viewers. You're, you're well trained. You're well trained right. and prepared. No, but I, I think that the messaging of a spring election would be positive for uh, Sunak. I would, Nigel. Look, it, it depends how Rishi's policies, the Prime Minister's policies, are looking. He's made some commitments to the public about what he sees he's going to be doing with inflation, what he's going to be doing with the small boats, what he's going to be doing with waiting lists. These are the markers he's laid down to show that he's performing. And if those things, which he does seem to be be getting a grip on those things if that continues well you can you know cast the numbers either way but it does he, he is having an impact on these things if he gets more confidence from the public in him as a prime minister that just continues now he could keep building on that it's always a risk because a week's a long time in politics you take the summer and something comes out of nowhere and creates a further problem so I think there is an opportunity in the spring absolutely but the smart money is still on autumn because that'll give him a longer period to hopefully get the economy where he wants it to be. And it always really is when it comes down to it about the economy. And Rishi, and, and Rishi made it quite clear at Tory conference he was leaving the party behind. It has suddenly become a cult of Rishi. Um, we became I in his speech. And it was all about me, me, me. And it was, the idea is vote for him. And I think that possibly, it, uh, Calvi is right there, should he be able to meet the targets that he's set himself? Then he could go early. There's Tom, no yeah, hope what do you of think? meeting the targets that he set himself. Let's be honest. There is just no hope. And I think the longer it t takes for us to have an election, the better, because then the independents will be able to organise themselves better. Mm. Are you talking about Reform UK I'm and others? Talk I'm talking about anybody who has true um, central ideologies, who believes in freedom of speech, who believes in the way that we should be living here in the West. I don't know what's been going on with the Conservatives lately. I don't, I, I've never understood. It's all bad. It's, it's all, no, no, and, and also, you know, don't talk to me about albeit bad, because your guy can't tell what a woman is. I mean, for, for me, it's game over there. It's completely game over. We just need something else. What we've had so far is not working for us. So that you'd like to have an October poll so that the smaller parties can mobilise and possibly influence the outcome. What do you think? Would you like an election in the spring market? GBnews.com. Coming up, more of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. Uh, I think we've got the Mirror. Um, what else have we got, Greg? I think a few other. Oh, we've got the Mail as well. The Mail newspaper, which is, uh, I believe, the most read English language newspaper in the world. And uh, the Mirror, oh, both good papers. And the Telegraph as well. Um, but look, also, my pundits will be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros. Don't go anywhere. We've saved our best till last. We're here for the show. More energy this time!
Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. Bellissima. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sunday, the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. OK, headline heroes and back page zeros coming up. But first, let's have a look at more front pages. Here's the mirror. And they lead with fears of an all-out war. Israel is facing a fight on three fronts. UN plea to end the hell of innocent people. Also, Madge, magic and mayhem on tour. Madonna there in her world tour, getting five-star reviews. Fair play. Also, Kate, the Princess of Wales is, given, Wales, is given something to celebrate. Well done, England in the rugby. Daily Mail. Uh, the police are coming for you if you glorify terrorism. The Daily Telegraph. Israel vows to destroy Lebanon if war spreads. Also, terror officers help inquiry after killing outside migrant center. OK, folks, we'll look. Uh, we'll get to your headline heroes and back page zeros. Uh, a little bit of developing news. I can't say breaking news because that's Polly's job. But I can say that a story has kicked off. And it's, it's happened on my phone, actually. Mrs. Dolan's been in touch, and uh, she's turned the heater on for the first time this year. What does she think I'm made of money? <laughs> Have you got the heat on? Mark at gbnews.com. Is that the moment? Is that the moment of the year when the old radiators get fired up? Or you switch on the fire? Let me know what's happening in your house. But Shay Dolan, the heat is on. I Anyone else? The, Have you got I, the heat on today? I changed the yep. thermostats this weekend. Yep. yep. Did, did. We did last week. Yeah. Last week you went early. Yep, we went early. Yep. It was still warm last yeah. week. I know, and I decided we'd be prepared for winter. <laughs> I, 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 just, I, I could just already feel the bills coming through yeah. the post. It is an annual event, though. It's a moment in the year, isn't it, when, yeah, when, when, when the heat goes on? But actually, walking today, it's beautiful sunlight, but it's really, really chilly. It's so, yeah, yeah, it was time. Do you think central heating is like a luxury? 
Or, or is it a human right? It's a human right, but it is a luxury to have it on all the I've got, we debated this last year, I've got wonderful viewers and listeners who are of an older vintage, and they say, look, in the 1940s and 50s, there was no central heating. We've got very used to it. Have we gone soft? We have, actually, forget about 1940s and 50s. My husband tells me that when he was younger, they didn't have central heating in his house, and it was just the front room with the fire in it, and they'd all kind of huddle in there. Actually, I think it's really great for family. If you have one room that's mm. hot, then you get to spend time with your children. We've got to yeah. reinstate the fire places though yeah. that, that's oh, the problem yeah. Yeah. We, we, yeah we ripped those all out didn't Climate we change. <laughs> oh, yeah. and you have just texted mr dolan back saying switch off the heat i'm not made of money wear another jumper so let's see what kind of reception i get when i get home a cold one i think yes. <laughs> a little bit frosty a little bit frosty okay uh, let's get tonya's headline hero of the day so my headline hero is our very own alison pearson because she has written some absolutely incredible columns in the daily mail mm. have been so emotive about what's going on so if you just yes. want to read about what's going on from from a mother's point of view actually from a woman's point of view i i think that she's just wonderful and also she's one of us a candidate for one of the well the best journalist in the country absolutely um unmissable every every week in the uh, in the uh, telegraph sometimes more often than that right Colby, your headline hero uh, um, a man who many people will not have heard of but he is a dear friend of mine so i will declare that is nevin truesdale who this week has set out some major reforms on one of the globe's major sporting events the grand national and and we all love the national even if you're not a racing fan you know it's happening somewhere in the world someone will put up an only bet they'll put on in a year yes. But what the Jockey Club, under Nev's really careful, considered, common sense approach, have looked at, they've always done this. Let's be clear, horses' welfare comes first. Uh, you know, uh, but what they've looked at is saying, how do we make it even safer? How do we make it a better spectacle? And they've done it through data. They've looked at the speeds that the horses have been racing, has been increasing because they're getting better trained. So they've moved one of the fences to slow down the speeds. They've taken, they'll take at least, I think, six horses out. So it'll be 34 Brilliant. in the field. So it won't be so chaotic at the start cutting that that potential for any fatality or injuries to the horses and making it just something that everyone can really enjoy rather than be concerned about the welfare of the animals and I think that's Brilliant. a fantastic job but he's also brought the horse racing community together around this and done this in a very wonderful way what a worthy nominee uh, Nigel briefly if you can your headline hero yeah it's the 10 British hostages uh, held by Hamas at the moment yeah. they'll need uh, all the heroism they can muster to get through that ordeal uh, Sue says uh, it's three degrees outside and our boiler is not working. Why does a boiler always break when it gets cold? Uh, Bruce says no heat till trick or treat. Uh, Graham, I live in Scotland, so the heating's been on for ages. Cost me a fortune. I pay more tax up here as well. Uh, Graham, let's get rid of that SMP, shall we? OK, briefly, your back page zeros. Oh, Sadiq Khan. I mean, I mean, just, just Sadiq Khan. I don't even have to justify it. Sadiq Khan, really, for everything that he's done, but mainly because he hasn't really called out these dreadful protests that have been backing Hamas, that have been going on in, in his alleged London. So, Sadiq Khan. OK, well, to be fair to Mayor Khan, he, he has spoken out about uh, any hate towards any groups in London. Not enough. But, um, but obviously, you're entitled to your view. Now, briefly, your back page. Uh, Hussam Zam Zomlot who I may not pronounce that correctly, but he's the Palestinian uh, ambassador to the UK, mm. um, unable to condemn Hamas today on a rival broadcaster in an interview he was doing. I just found that how, how he could not say that what they did was wrong, that it's terror, that it's evil. That is the fundamental problem when we have this debate, that we must have decent Palestinians okay. calling out Hamas and the ambassador to the UK must be one of them. Jeremy right. Corbyn, for similar reasons, they've got a lot of time for, for Corbyn, uh, but not when he doesn't unequivocally condemn Hamas. Amen to that. Uh, Jason says, obviously none of you live up north. We've had the heating on for a month now. <laughs> um, I'm back tomorrow at nine. Headliners is next. Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry. Here are your GB News weather forecasts provided by the Met Office. If you enjoyed the fine conditions we've had around this weekend, we will be holding on to that into the start of the new week as well. A lot of nice conditions to end this evening with as well. A few scattered showers for some coastal districts in the north, but most of us will be staying dry. Some isolated mist and fog patches are possible overnight and temperatures will be tumbling down a bit. Mid to low single figures in our towns and cities. Rural spots can expect a touch of frost, particularly for central southern Scotland down into northern England. So quite a chilly start to Monday morning. There will also be a touch more cloud around on Monday compared to the weekend. So I can't promise the wall to wall sunshine that some of us had throughout Saturday and Sunday. But some brightness still poking through hazy sunshine in there. Showers feeding into the far southeast of England. A few deaths across northern Scotland as well. 
Temperatures perhaps up by a degree or so compared to Sunday, generally around 11 to 13 degrees Celsius. The winds though will be strengthening in the southwest and that is due to this area of low pressure that is gradually going to push its way northwards as we head towards Tuesday. So increasingly starting to see gales develop for parts of Wales and southwest England as we head into Tuesday. Most of us should say dry during daylight hours though, just this shield of cloud gradually pushing its way northward. So again, sunshine turning hazier in places. This rain though will eventually move its way in as we head into the middle part of the week, potentially heavy at times and some disruption is possible, so do keep up to date with the forecast. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, The P.